Donald Trump speaking at the Union League in Philadelphia on military affairs and national security. Let's go ahead and take a listen. And easing the tensions within our troubled world. This will require rethinking the failed policies of the past. We can make new friends, rebuild old alliances, and bring new allies into the fold, and we can do that. I'm proud to have the support of war-fighting generals, active-duty military, and top experts who know both how to win and how to avoid endless wars that we're caught up in, like the one we have right now that just never, ever ends, our longest war. Just yesterday, 88 top generals and admirals endorsed my campaign. And these people are fantastic. Thank you. In the Trump administration, our actions in the Middle East will be tempered by realism. The current strategy of toppling regimes with no plan for what to do the day after only produces power vacuums that are filled simply by terrorists. Gradual reform, not sudden and radical change, should be our guiding objective in that region. We should work with any country that shares our goal of destroying ISIS and defeating radical Islamic terrorism. And we're going to form new friendships and partnerships based on this mission and this mission alone. We now have an administration and a former Secretary of State who refuse to say radical Islamic terrorism. And unless you're going to say the words, you're never going to solve the problems. Very simple. <laughs> Immediately after taking office, I will ask my generals to present to me a plan within 30 days to defeat and destroy ISIS. This will require military warfare, but also cyber warfare, financial warfare, and ideological warfare, as I laid out in my speech on defeating radical Islamic terrorism several weeks ago. Instead of an apology tour, which you saw President Obama give over and over again, I will proudly promote our system of government and our way of life as the best in the world, just like we did in our campaign against communism during the Cold War. We will show the whole world how proud we are to be Americans. At the same time, immigration security is a vital part of our national security. We only want to admit people to our country who will support our values and love our people. They have to love our people. These are, in fact, the pillars of a sound national security strategy. Unlike my opponent, my foreign policy will emphasize diplomacy, not destruction. Hillary Clinton's legacy in Iraq, Libya, Syria has produced only turmoil and suffering and death. Her destructive policies have displaced millions of people. Then she has invited these refugees into the West with no plan to screen them, including veteran health care costs. And this was just announced and read over the last number of weeks. The price of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan will total approximately $6 trillion. We could have rebuilt our country over and over again. Yet, after all this money was spent and lives lost, Clinton's policies as Secretary of State have left the Middle East 
in more disarray than ever before, not even close. Had we done nothing, we would have been in far better position. Meanwhile, China has grown more aggressive and North Korea more dangerous and belligerent than ever. Russia has defied this administration at every single turn. Putin has no respect for President Obama and has absolutely no respect for Hillary Clinton. Sometimes it seemed like there wasn't a country in the Middle East that Hillary Clinton didn't want to invade, intervene in, or topple. She's trigger happy and very unstable. Whether we like it or not, that's what's going on. She's also reckless, so reckless, in fact, that she put her emails on an illegal server that our enemies could easily hack and probably have. Then Clinton's team used a technology called BleachBit, which is basically acid, and this is going to acid wash her emails. Who would do this? And nobody does it because of the expense. Who would do this? They even took a hammer to some of her 13 phones to cover up her tracks in obstruction of justice. These email records were destroyed after she received a subpoena. Remember that word, after, after she received a subpoena from Congress to turn them over. If you do that in private enterprise, it's a violation of the law. She did this after receiving a subpoena from the United States Congress. In the FBI report, she claimed she couldn't recall important information on 39 separate and different occasions. She can't even remember whether she has trained in the use of classified information. And she said she didn't know the letter C means confidential or at least classified. If she can't remember such crucial events and information, honestly, She's totally unfit to be our Commander-in-Chief. Totally unfit. <laughs> but I have a feeling she did remember, and she does know, and that also makes her unfit. Her conduct is simply disqualifying. She talks about her experience, but Hillary Clinton's only foreign policy experience ended up in absolute failure. Everywhere she got involved, things got worse. Let's look back at the Middle East at the very beginning of 2009, before Hillary Clinton was sworn in. Libya was stable. Syria was under control. Egypt was ruled by a secular president and an ally of the United States. Iraq was experiencing a reduction in violence. The group that would become what is now called ISIS was close to being extinguished. Would have never happened. Would have never happened. Iran was being choked off by economic sanctions. Fast forward to today. What have we gotten from the horrible, horrible decisions made by Barack Obama and Secretary Clinton? Libya is in ruins. Our ambassador and three other brave Americans are dead. And ISIS has gained a new base of operations and taken their very valuable oil. Syria is in the midst of a disastrous civil war. ISIS controls large portions of territory. A refugee crisis now threatens Europe and the United States. And hundreds of thousands of people are dead. In Egypt, terrorists have gained a foothold in the Sinai Desert, near the Suez Canal, one of the most essential waterways anywhere in the world. Iraq is in chaos, and ISIS is on the loose. 
And Iran, by the way, will be taking over Iraq and their vast oil reserves. ISIS has spread across the Middle East and into the West. Iran, the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism, is now flush with $150 billion in cash being released and released by the United States, plus another $1.7 billion that we just learned about last evening in cash ransom payments. We thought it was $400 million. Turns out that it's now $1.7 billion in cash. In other words, our country was blackmailed and extorted into paying this unheard of amount of money as ransom. And our president lied to us. Worst of all, the nuclear deal puts Iran, the number one state sponsor of radical Islamic terrorism, on a path to nuclear weapons. And that path will go very quickly. This is Hillary Clinton's foreign policy legacy failure and death. But that's not all. President Obama and Hillary Clinton have also overseen deep cuts in our military, which only invite more aggression. Really, we will have aggression like you've never seen before, and you've got it already happening. Our adversaries are chomping at the bit. History shows that when America is not prepared is when the danger is by far the greatest. We want to deter, avoid, and prevent conflict through our unquestioned military strength. We have the greatest people in the world. We have to give them the greatest <laughs> equipment. Under Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, defense spending is on track to fall to its lowest level as a share of the economy since the end of World War II. We currently have the smallest army since 1940. The Navy is among the smallest it has been since 1915. It's 100 years ago. And the Air Force is the smallest it's been since 1947. When Ronald Reagan left office, our Navy had 592 ships. When Barack Obama took office, it had 285 ships. Today, the Navy has just 276 ships. The average Air Force aircraft is 27 years old. We have second generation B-52 bombers. Their fathers flew the same plane as they're flying right now. This is not the United States. Our army has been shrinking rapidly from 553,000 soldiers to, in 2009, to just 479,000 soldiers today. It's some decrease, and they want to make it smaller. In 2009, our Marine Corps had 202,000 active Marines. Today, it's 182,000. Our ship count is below the minimum of 308 that the Navy says is needed to execute its current Michigans at a minimal level. President Obama plans to reduce the Army to 450,000 troops, which would hamstring our ability to defend the United States. It takes 22 years on average to field a major new weapon system. In 2010, the United States spent $554 billion on non-war base defense spending. In the year, and I have to say, currently, we're spending $548 billion, a cut of 10 percent, and that number is going down very rapidly looking into the future, unless I become your president. After this reduction was done through what is known as sequester, which you've all heard about, or automatic defense budget cuts. Under the budget agreement, defense took half of the cuts, even though it makes up only one-sixth 
of the budget. So they put it all in defense. As soon as I take office, I will ask Congress to fully eliminate the defense sequester and will submit a new budget to rebuild our military. It is so depleted. We will rebuild our military. This will increase certainty in the defense community as to funding and will allow military leaders to plan for our future defense needs. And most importantly, we will be defended because without defense, we don't have a country. Thank you very much.